Hi, good afternoon and welcome to our quarterly update. I'm Mark Alara and I'm joined by Kenneth. Um, today we've got uh, Kenneth providing our normal market update and as it, and just prior to that I'm just going to provide a different focus. Mine today is going to be on managing retirement risk. So the focus there is on the sequence of investment returns and the risk that that can have to um, the investment balance and the funding or longevity of someone's retirement. So firstly, I suppose, you know, this comes about because of market volatility. I mean, it's definitely directed the investors and financial and our focus as financial managers to the impact of sequencing risk and the potential damage and effect it can have on retirement savings. So all that sequencing risk is, it's a sequence of returns. In other words, the order in which your investment returns occur. So it, from an investment point of view, it impacts those when you're adding or withdrawing down on your investments. And whilst this is a retirement management risk, because in retirement, it can actually mean a much lower rate of return than you may have expected, and therefore uh, a shortened period for the longevity of your capital. So how it occurs is when you need, when you retire, you may need to sell down capital to support your cash flow needs. And the problem occurs when if the negative returns occur uh, first, you end up having to sell some holdings. And therefore, it reduces the availability of those shares to be there so when the markets recover, that they can participate in that recover, that recovery. Um, and therefore, they can then undertake their normalised investment return process through you know, the recurring of positive returns. So it, it, the easy way to explain it, it's the opposite of dollar cost averaging, effectively. So the way to explain it is just uh, is a couple of um, charts here, uh, tables to represent you know, what that might mean. So if we look at the first, this is just utilising an example of 750,000 members account balance in superannuation, as an example. So we just did it over a 10 year period and we've had an opening balance of 750,000. So the first column there, we look at if they have a poor start. So year one, negative 12, year two, negative 22, year three, eight, and then it goes into a, a, a positive sequence of returns. Versus the second column, if we had a good start, 13%, 15%, 12%, 17%, etc. But all we've done is flipped those exact same 10 returns into the opposite order. So then we finish up with that, you know, the negative 12% return. If there's no contributions to capital or drawdowns at capital, we end up with the same average rate of return, which you'd expect in both cases. There. So sequencing risk comes into or causes havoc when you start drawing or adding to capital, particularly on the drawdown stage. So we, and it can have a significant difference. So if we look at the exact same returns, 750,000 opening balance, but we draw, we have a drawdown or pension of 40,000 annually. When we get to year 10, the average returns and percentages are based, but the impact, the internal rate of return for the investment is vastly different. So with a good start, 794,000 account balance up to 10 years from a member, with a bad start, 423,000. So, you know, 370,000, you know, quite a significant difference by just a sequence of returns. So what today's topic is about is really about are there ways to manage that? that. So, so the danger zone of, of the sequence of returns risk is really we find out that a member's account balance is often the largest in the five years leading up to retirement and the first five years of retirement because they're contributing up to retirement and haven't drawn down any pension yet. So that's what we call the danger zone. That being said, this is this is a um, or should be a constant focus on managing such risk in retirement, particularly in drawdown mode or pension phase, because it's a year-to-year -year basis of of managing that uh, a member's cash flow. So an easy way to think about it is it, it can happen and it does happen. And if you think about the impact that would have happened of a retiree if they retired just prior to the the global financial crisis or the GFC 
uh, and they have to draw down on capital. The significant impact that would have had and the shortening of their longevity of capital. So, you know, whilst we don't expect volatility of that magnitude, you know, what we need to take from this is that is our learnings in such volatile times is that the way that we need to apply our management of cash flows and assets and asset allocations to clients' um, retirement savings. So there's only so many levers that we can adjust in managing this process or managing, you know, sequencing risk. So the first one is the first two, or sorry, first one is, is accumulation phase and the next three are uh, the levers in pension phase or the drawdown phase. So in contributing to super, um, for all those investors in, in accumulation phase, it's a very simple process of making regular contributions rather than one lump sum at the end of the financial year or during the financial year. Um, and that's a, that's a nice positive way on how we can help manage the volatility of returns. So all, all it is is just dollar cost averaging. And you know when markets fall, we're picking up cheaper assets periodically. And if markets are, um, are higher, we're not, we're not putting as much money in expenses or more expensive, not necessarily expensive, but more expensively priced assets. So we're just dollar cost averaging. Um, and as opposed to if you just put a lump sum in, well then you'll pick it up the return at that particular period. Um, that could either be a windfall if they're cheap or um, not such windfall if they're expensive. Obviously over time that would smooth. Um, in drawdown phase, there's probably only three that, that we can use as a, as a lever. One is having spending flexibility. And really all this is about is making sure a retiree uh, is flexible on the amount that they draw down. So the focus there is on the minimum amount of pension that they withdraw um, in order to meet the cost of living. So the way that we deal with that is making sure that, if possible, that the return on those investments are enough to meet that cost of living. And that's usually a focus on cash flow. So when we're talking with clients, we're always working on cash flow. So when markets are good or bad, that if there's consistency in the delivery of those, those distributions or earnings from those investments, then the cash flow remains intact and you're not forced to sell assets to put food on the table. The key there is having a sufficient capital base. So really that focus on that is one, leading up to retirement to make sure you've, you've accumulated sufficient capital and two, in retirement, that we're structuring the assets in a way that we know that we're delivering consistent and reliable income streams. Um, however, you do need a sufficient capital base where you are not drawing more than the cash flow and therefore a smaller capital base where you're drawing down on capital to fund your lifestyle is inappropriate for this option. The second lever um, that we focus on is just reducing portfolio volatility. And again, this is all about ha having a sufficient capital base so that if we model out a low level rate of return, uh, that'll allow as an investor to hold more defensive assets and therefore reduce the overall um, portfolio of the assets that are exposed to volatility or, or extreme volatility and therefore reduces the sequence risk that uh, of likely negative returns. So. Um, because th those negative returns are going to come from more volatile assets, such as Australian shares and international shares. So the way to deal with that is um, whether we can actually model a low rate of return. So it's about having sufficiency of assets. So we do with a, uh, a risk profile and longevity, longevity of capital modeling uh, as your advisor uh, to help determine what level of risk that you either need to accept uh, for your personal objectives or talk to you about um, tempering those personal objectives into something more realistic expectations. So today's focus is on this fourth uh, lever here and that's we, we've labeled as padding your assets. So this is really an asset allocation strategy but an active asset allocation strategy and you've probably heard in the marketplace otherwise known as a bucket strategy. Um, and really, this is how can we protect those assets in market downturns, in volatile times when, when we're drawing pensions. So in short, um, as mentioned about active as, uh, asset allocation, but actively managing. Now, 
Um, we manage asset allocations to ensure that you've got adequate diversification and uh, actively manage them to overweight to underweight positions um, for our performance. But that's that's a particular aspect. The focus today is on managing within that diversification to ensure that retiree has sufficient reserves to manage their risk. So sufficient cash and defensive assets. Um, to offset a lack of income or performance in a volatile period, those reserves are used um, for those emergencies, for the want of a better word. And it should cover everything necessary for pensions, expenses, and anything operational for um, the, the fund itself. Um, often we carry um, at least a year or two, uh, sometimes more depending on the, you know, the client and the capital base. But really, it's just making sure that we've got that sufficiency of defensive assets and cash to fund a few years' worth of lifestyle drawdowns and expenses so that you're not forced into a position to sell assets. Um, so mark, when markets are performing well, what we're doing is actively managing that, taking monies out of growth assets and allocating them back to more defensive investments. And when markets are poorer, all we're doing is topping up the income from those reserves or emergency positions from cash and defensive assets. Um, what it does do is importantly, the way that it works is it allows your growth assets to maintain that exposure. So we're not selling those growth assets in this case. So therefore, it, it allows it to participate in the recovery of, um, of a market. Um, I guess this is probably one of the, the big differences, uh, or one of many differences, but a key difference in the lack of padding or the ability to pad or operate bucket, bucket strategies. Um, it's definitely a weakness when you're looking at retail and industry funds because you're going into a balanced fund. Um, so much so that you're even starting to see things that uh, with you know industry funds that they have life cycle asset allocation. So as you're getting older, you're winding down your exposure to, to um, growth assets. And what that means, so potentially, is yes, it reduces the volatility um, and the, the risk of sequencing risk, but what it also does is it reduces your exposure to growth assets and therefore potentially shortens the longevity of your capital. Um, so we would, we would obviously believe that our strategy or the ability to operate these strategies is better than a, a life cycle. So it's a customized strategy taking into consideration your personal circumstances and your objectives. Um, a quick one just to show you here. Um, it, this is just a graph just showing that 750,000, 40,000 drawdown, um, showing the bad starts and the good start, and some average rate of return. So growth assets 7%, income 5 and 2% in cash. What it's showing there is that if you have a good start, you know, obviously you can see that yellow line there growing. An average start in the grey line, you, you're maintaining the balance in your capital, not necessarily against... Um, um, present values, but, but maintaining it um, on, a, on a face value. And the blue line is just showing cash. If you have a bad start and don't have a sequencing risk strategy where you have that defensive assets, then what this graph shows is that that um, dark orange line there is that it actually ends up worse than being in cash. Um, importantly, it doesn't mean that you put your money in cash alone. So, because if the next graph here is showing that if you, we put three years worth of cash, three years worth of income required in cash, being the 40,000 drawdown, so three times that is 120, um, and four times in income producing assets and the balance of the money is in growth, that whilst initially that, that, you know, a bad start, you're below a cash position, it doesn't take long to part way through the, the life of those assets to actually be in a better position. And therefore, it actually extends the longevity of that capital. So holding assets in a diversified portfolio and not just in cash, along with having a, a sequencing risk strategy, puts you at a better position than cash. But more importantly, you've got all that upside. And that's you so you'll, you've managed your downside risk and then you've got all the upside for good and average returns positions. 
and that's really what this is about is, is trying to not shoot the lights out but but manage your risk in retirement so summary look there's a host of ways of, of preparing um to prepare for sequence of returns risk um regardless of who it is it all starts with understanding your unique exposure and requirements uh, and choosing the right approach the right lever to use or a combination of those levers to manage that exposure so the right solution is naturally a direct function of your specific uh, position um, and objective so um, if you're managing if you're coming up to retirement or in retirement by all means reach out for us on this um, Kenneth, I'll leave it to you for market update. Thanks, Mark. <clears throat> so, what I really want to drive home today are three things. Valuations on our market at the moment, what's caused those valuations, and then finally, what we're doing. Um, and to start with, I think it's important to go back a couple of months and just have a look at the reporting season on a, on a high level. Um, uh, we just came through a half year reporting season in February where it, it seemed like our, our, our uh, companies were, were hitting targets and they, and they were, which is, which is great. But to the bottom left, uh, which shows the, re, the revisions to earnings growth, um, you can see that those expectations had really, really dramatically dropped throughout uh, the, the first half of 2019 uh, or 1819. So if you go back, we we, we we were starting at around about 7% 7, 7 in September after um, after the, the, the last reporting season. And then right through to January, um, which is the, at the back end of January, the reporting season starts. Um, you can see we're sitting at 4.3. We're, we're now sitting at 2.7% for industrial companies. So uh, if you're looking at that by itself, you'd think the market would have gone down. Um, on, on the right, however, it's, it's showing the expectations that, m that analysts are predicting for companies between their first half earnings in, in 2019 and their second half. And then the grey, Sorry, that's the blue. And then in the grey, that's showing you the the last three years average. So you can see really on the average, it's a 50-50 split basically between first half and second half. Um, this year, however, we have an abnormal second half skew that companies have to hit on their earnings uh, to, to meet those already, I would say, um, uh, bleak expectations. Uh, so with an, with an election coming up, um, the consumers, uh, I suppose, not, not in the best shape uh, as it has been. Um, we're a little cautious on companies being able to hit that target. Um, so really, uh, w since then, we've actually had a sharp lift in valuations and I, I we're actually um, uh, a little cautious on that. So. so when when I was talking about the the earnings growth that we're seeing, I think it's important to have a look at it over a longer term period. Um, so this is an Australian uh, industrials average of um, their earnings, um, and then the multiple that they trade on, which is on the right hand side. So We've actually seen earnings per share estimates starting to, to fall uh, in the industrials sector. Um, if, if you couple that with how the market's going, it's actually going up. Uh, so, so something has to give there. Either we're, we're going to see a, a marked lift in those earnings and, and that, that second half skew that we were talking about before m might eventuate, or we'll have to see the valuations come back to a more normalized level. So on the right hand side there, you can see the how we're trading at the moment. We're above 16 times um, Ford price to earnings multiple. Uh, if you look at the five year average, we're above that. And then we're, we're above the, the 10 year average as well. I would tend to focus on that five year average um, because we're of the belief that the, the valuations that we're seeing on our market have actually come about because of the 10-year 
Australian bond rate falling to record lows. So if you're an investor and you need a return, you can't get it from your defensive assets, being the bonds. Where do you go? You go into the market or, or the equity market and you lift valuations up. So, so that's how we are seeing uh, the market at the moment. Um, what I think is interesting though is if you, if you look at this compared to the US. So on the next slide, uh, it's, it's the S&P 500 earnings and where they're trading at. And I think it's good to look at the US. One, we have a, uh, the majority of our international exposure um, US focused. Um, and two, it, it, it's the bellwether economy. So anytime you look at the news, you, 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 you're seeing these numbers. Um, what you'll find is when everyone's talking about the US and, and, and where valuations are stretched, in our view, they're not anywhere near as stretched as the, the the Australian market. So you can see here, it's exactly the same. Uh, you can see that their earnings haven't fallen off uh, like the, uh, our domestic economy. Um, and also, they're actually around their five-year average. So they are starting to creep up. This is uh, this was actually at the start of April, so they have moved up a little bit. Um, but by no no means would I call that a uh, 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 an exceptionally overvalued market. And this is back on the, the Australian um, market now. And look, all that this is looking at is is each sector, where their valuation is now on a, on a, on a price to earnings multiple for the next 12 months. So on the left hand side, you've got those black bars um, and then their earnings growth. Uh, so it, it's, it's going back to uh, the, the, the front slide and saying, well, valuations are high and we're not market timers. They can they can stay high for a number of years. That's the, that's what happens in markets. There's a there's an old saying: the the market can stay in irrational uh, uh, longer than you can stay solvent. So we're not market timers. We, we're just pointing out the fact that valuations are elevated across pretty much all sectors compared to their uh, averages, and it's important to be mindful of that. So valuations are high. We think they're high because people need to to generate a return from, and the the defensive sector is 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 very tough to get that return. So what do we concentrate on? We concentrate on asset allocation, and I think it's more important than ever um, in in this type of environment to make sure that you're looking at how your portfolio is positioned um, in respect to uh, your, the risk that you're willing to take. Um, and it actually ties in nicely with what Mark was talking about. If, you, if you're a pensioner or you know, nearing retirement, it, we've had a 10 year bull run globally in, in markets. It's, it's very important to make sure that you're aware that there are other asset classes and, and holding them, uh, th there's benefits to that. So this is just the, the, the current uh, Morgan strategic asset allocation recommendations from conservative right through to aggressive. Um, what you should be doing is having a look and, and making sure that you've done a risk profile and that you're um, uh, on, on top of looking at uh, active asset allocation. <clears throat> so. I think it's very important to have a look at some key economic issues because we, we do field a lot of questions on this and I'd like to start with the Australian economy. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of headlines out there that are, are, are quite bleak on the, on the Australian economy and for us, I think that there's, uh, there's a few moving parts here. So on the one hand, you do have a, a weaker consumer than you, 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 we've been seeing over the past number of years. But on the flip side to that, we actually have very, very strong employment. Um, uh, you know, it continues to impress. We've got an Aussie dollar that's starting to, to uh, fall. Uh, we're now uh, around about 70 cents. Um, we've got the, the resource sector uh, is actually very, very strong. Uh, we're seeing continued um, farm inflows into that area. And you can see it with the likes of, you know, BHP, Fortescue and Rio. They're, that's on the big end of town, 
they've done quite well. But um, so it's a, it's a, all of that is a tale of two parts for the Australian economy. We're actually calling for uh, above trend growth, um, and this is done by our chief economist Michael Knox. Um, uh, I, I think the one one thing that has slightly changed um, is that the RBA. It, it's turned into a live meeting pretty much every month now. The, the, we had a, a quite weak um, uh, CPI reading uh, last week, so that you know it, it's a 50/50 call. Um, we're, we're we're staying with that it's a flat forecast, um, but overall, even with the the um, uh, the election, which may cause business and households to to sort of hold back until that's finished, um, things have been going. All right. So again, we we, we, we do focus on the US. Uh, it's a bellwether economy, and what we what we saw in 2018 was nothing short of phenomenal. They had a very very strong uh, GDP, both on a macro side and on corporate profits. Uh, we we had uh, tax cuts flow through. And everything was was firing, and what 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 that meant was that inflation expectations started to creep up. Um, since then, there was uh, we, we had the market jitters in in December, um, or, or, or really that September December quarter, uh, and we've actually seen a flood back in to a more dovish stance on on bond. Bond rates. So the Fed sort of reverse course. We've we've seen liquidity come back into the market, and it goes flows straight through back to the to the bonds. If, if if bonds are being bid down and you can't get a return, you see equities start to push up. So that's what's happened in the U.S. The the GDP uh, is starting to come down slightly, and this is just the the, the U.S. Federal Reserve projections. Um, unemployment is at record lows. Um, uh, currently, 3.7%. They're, they're they're projecting that to tick up slightly, but it's it's, it's no no real um, cause for concern, uh, and that inflation at the moment is is to remain steady. So, what's happening with debt uh, around the world? Uh, and and at the moment, it seems to be the core driver of markets. We saw. September through December, as I just touched on, um, bond yields were going up. It looked like the cost of debt was going up, and subsequently, e equity prices really capitulated. We had a 20% fall, um, pretty much globally. Um, the US changed course. They've said that bond rates are, are to remain lower, so the cost of debt's come down, um, and we've seen a flood back into equities. This is something that we uh, weren't predicting. We, we actually thought uh, last year that interest rates were on the rise. Um, I think now that we're, we're, we're at a flat or at least flat for a very long time before it starts to uh, increase again. And this is just a little overview. I've used this slide before of the, the economic cycle. Um, uh, it, <laughs> You know, the question is where where are we? No, no one really knows. But what we tend to tend to look at is, you know, commodities have had a great run uh, from 2016 to now. They've they've been in in an upgrade cycle. Um, whether that uh, continues on, we're not sure. Um, the yield curve has started to flatten out. Um, so we we think we're, we're we're leaning towards the more cash defensive value rather than the commodity cyclical value. Um, so what we're doing, uh, looking at uh, companies that are delivering quite good cash flow, that their earnings are defensive, um, and, and really monitoring that asset allocation to make sure we still have that defensive side in there. One commodity that I thought I'd touch on, and again I've used this slide before uh, because it hasn't had a run, uh, is copper. So we we tend to find a lot of or tend to field a lot of questions currently, looking to how to get exposure to the energy. Uh, sorry, the electric the electric car market and 
people tend to automatically go towards lithium or cobalt and they're very opaque minerals so there's not a, a long track record there and we tend to focus for clients on companies that can deliver cash flows and a lot of the the smaller companies that are trying to benefit from electric cars or the electrification of the world that that are in that that space in the lithium uh, space can't deliver that but what we can focus on if people want to get exposure to that is copper um, there's plenty of, of large cap uh, and mid cap resource copper exposures that have healthy cash flows good balance sheets and will benefit if that if that is to occur across the world so the electrification of the world um, uh, and what we've seen is with this flood of liquidity back into the market and, and, and China's also had a, a stimulus program going is that copper is starting to trend a little higher um, so I think that's one to, to continue on to, to look at over the next six to twelve months Finally, on the on the economic side, we've uh, had a look at um, the, the Australian housing prices because they're, they're, they're hitting the headlines almost daily. Um, we're actually of the opinion that the uh, the hard yards have been been felt in the Australian uh, housing um, sector. Um, it might fall a little further, but we think that now with the Royal Commission. Uh, out of the way, you, you, you're sort of having a, a loosening of, of the RBA expectations, possibly a rate cut, um, that, that that will help sort of soften uh, what, what's being experienced in, really it's the Sydney, Melbourne area. Um, and uh, even though the headlines have, have been fairly drastic, but the falls that we've seen haven't been, you know, huge. So we're, we're actually calling for that to, to you know, be controlled over the next 12 months. Finally, uh, we run model portfolios here at North Quay. Um, uh, you know, they, they're only recommended guides, but what they do is um, we have three that, that focus on individual um, characteristics, um, income, growth and balanced. Um, what we do is we we meet on a monthly basis. The the, the stock ideas uh, are drawn from our research strategy, institutional dealing desks, uh, meeting with with companies on a on, on a daily basis through our morning meetings, and then we overlay this with sector allocation. And so using you know consensus research data, looking at the liquidity to make sure that they're right for our clients, and and touching on that the the current cyclical trends that are that are looking uh, or, or that are happening in our market so um, they're run in house uh, and what we do is we, we also bring in two uh, external members to give up impartiality to the process so uh, I've just got the uh, the returns here so we've got the <coughs> the, the balanced uh, it's been the best performing over this past year uh, we've then <coughs> Uh, we've got the income model. Uh, this one uh, has had a, a quite a strong year as well, um, and is the the best over the um, uh, I suppose since inception. Uh, and then finally, uh, we've got the growth model. Uh, it's it's been the underperformer, um, but still had a pleasing one year result above the uh, accumulation index. So what we're focusing on, uh, cautious on those industrial valuations, really looking at those defensive equities, uh, ones with what we what we believe are defensive cash flows. So one uh, Aurora comes to mind, Tabcorp Holdings uh, and Telstra, um, West Farmers on a balance sheet side. Um, we're, we're starting to trim that, that cyclical exposure. Uh, so we've had fantastic returns for BHP and Rio, uh, Fortescue as well. We're starting to sell those um, uh, or, or, or trim. Um, we're, we're cautious on this second half. We've seen that, that, that skew that I was talking about at the start um, with earnings expectations falling away and in the current environment where the consumer's weak, we've got uh, the, 
the um, uh, the federal election on, I think it's going to be tough to have such a large second half skew in earnings. So there's actually a, a Macquarie conference that starts today. Uh, it's a, it's a well known to the market, and we think that that might be the catalyst for some of these companies to start downgrading their expectations. Um, so you know what we're looking to do there is just remain cautious on your asset allocation, making sure you've got the right cash levels um, mm. uh, and, and that flows into what we're targeting on, on the defensive side. So shorter dated hybrids uh, is what we, we continue to like, at least until the federal election's over. Um, on, a, on a stock front, uh, we think Jumbo Interactive uh, has, a, has an ability to pay a special dividend. Um, and on the flip side, we're actually calling for NAB to, to, to cut its dividends, so one to watch out for. Um, corporate activity, with the Australian dollar falling, it actually makes our domestic companies look quite attractive to internationals. And so there's uh, starting to see more M&A activity on our market. Um, and one that we've, we, we potentially flag as a candidate for that is Aveo Group. Um, trading well under its net tangible assets uh, and has flagged that it is looking for a buyer. So one to watch out for there. Uh, and then finally, uh, value oriented international exposure. So really concentrating on the quality end. So we've got quality index there, uh, utilization of specialist fund managers. So uh, that's a Magellan Income Trust. Uh, and then finally, uh, Apple uh, as, a, as a stock idea. Um, very, very strong um, cash flows and uh, trades on a, a, a quite a reasonable multiple. I noticed one of the things that you mentioned <laughs> earlier on the commodities front was <laughs> copper. Yes. So exposure for copper? Oz, yeah, certainly. Oz so minerals uh, Oz Minerals yeah. is, is, our, is our pick uh, for, for that particular space. Uh, our research analyst, Tom Sartor, does a great job um, in identifying these companies and I think he's called uh, Oz Minerals fantastically well. So that's one that we're, uh, we're looking at. All of that's obviously general advice. Yes. Um, so um, before you act on that, please seek some advice so that we can take into consideration your personal circumstances. Um, so that's it for today. So thanks, Kenneth. Um, like always, please uh, reach out if you want to discuss any aspect of today, be it market related or other financial strategies. We're more than welcome to um, have some obligation free discussions and, um, and go from there. So thanks again for attending and uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of your day.